Thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction, and uh, thanks to all the organizers for the invitation. It's uh, to be speaking here at IAS again. Um, so everything I present today will be joint work with Vincent Humilière and Frédéric Leroux. So in case I forget to mention their names throughout the talk, just remember that, please. Uh, I'll begin by giving an overview of the talk, because at some points it's going to get a bit technical. Uh, so hopefully by saying at the beginning what I'm going to do, you will manage to see the light at the end of the tunnel right away. Uh, so some overview and notation at first. Uh, I'll be working only with surfaces. So sigma for me throughout the talk will be either a closed surface uh, other than S2. It's too complicated. And if it's not closed, then I'll, I'll just work with R2. So these are the only surfaces I'll, I'll be working with. And C, so which I'll, I'll define at some point, will be, so there is, there is this uh, map on the space of time-dependent Hamiltonians on any symplectic manifold, but for today, just dealing with these surfaces. So this associates a real number to every time-dependent Hamiltonian. It's called like this, the spectral invariant of the Hamiltonian. Uh, so I'll write down its name. So this is the main character of the talk, the Hamiltonian spectral invariant. So for those of you who are familiar with Hamiltonian spectral invariants, this is the, the, the spectral invariant I have in mind is the one associated to the fundamental class of the surface. And the goal of the talk is the following. So these invariants are constructed using Hamiltonian floor theory. My goal is to, uh, our goal is to construct, well, this is what I'll do. I'll construct a new invariant. I don't know how, it's not supposed to be new. Uh, new dynamical, here's the key word is dynamical. And okay, so the goal is to give a dynamical, our goal is to give a dynamical construction of this floor theoretic invariant. So just use purely dynamical methods to reconstruct it. And so we have a candidate and we have not been able to prove it coincides with the spectral invariant. But what I'll show today is that the spectral invariant C and this new invariant N, they coincide for all autonomous Hamiltonians. So all time independent Hamiltonians. Okay. So that's the outline of the talk. Uh, so here's some more notation, and I'll, I'll give you a motivation as to why we're doing this. So here's notation and motivation. Uh, OK. so. Everybody's probably familiar with my notation, but just let's just remind everyone, if I have a time-dependent Hamiltonian, it gives rise to what's called a Hamiltonian flow. So that's my notation for it. And a time one map, so this is a Hamiltonian flow and a diffeomorphism. Time one map is a Hamiltonian diffeo. Um, I'll denote by fix sub C of the the femorphism, the set of contractible fixed points of it. And recall that if you have a contractible fixed point, then you could associate, a, you could define its action as follows. So the action of the fixed point is given by, so here's my convention. You integrate the Hamiltonian around the loop generated by the fixed point and then subtract uh, the area of a capping disk for the loop. 
So here is phi th of x, and u is a capping this. And I'll call spectrum of h to be the set of critical. Yes. In fact, so that's a part. That's one reason. No, it's just we don't have a candidate. <laughs> Maybe it's not the only reason. No, there are, there are two reasons that make our work really difficult. There a, this is one reason that makes things more complicated. So our invariant n just the, whatever n is, it won't work on S two. And we weren't able to somehow we it was like by trial and error that we found this n. We couldn't reproduce something on S two. One reason was this capping this. Another reason is that ham of S two has a non-trivial fundamental group, and that also made things more difficult. So the spectrum of H is a set of critical values of the action function, also the actions of these contractible fixed ones. Okay, so now I'll briefly say what the spectral invariant is. Uh, although all you need really for the talk is kind of an axiomatic definition of it. So here is uh, here's the definition of spectral invariance. Here are the names that go with this. So this is based on the work of Viterbo. So these are the guys who introduced them, Schwartz and O. So R2 here, the other surfaces here, and for O, O took care of the case of S2. So today, I, I guess I'll be, I'll be only talking about Viterbo and Schwartz's spectral invariant. And so here is a definition that, if you haven't seen it before, it might not make much sense, but I'll try to say a few words. Um, so I'll have to take you, well, maybe I'll start here. So suppose sigma is a, a floor cycle. So if sigma is a floor cycle, then I define its action to be, so sigma is, so here's the definition of the action of a floor cycle. It's the sum of one periodic orbits. Then I define uh, action of sigma to be the maximum of actions of these one periodic orbits. So is the definition of action of a floor cycle clear? OK, so this is, so given a sum of periodic orbits, this is the height at which, for the first time, you see you know, the action level at which, for the first time, you see this, this uh, cycle in the floor complex. And then to define the spectral invariant of a Hamiltonian, you take infimum over all cycles, which represent the fundamental class. So such that the floor homology, you know, in floor homology, sigma represents the fundamental class of the manifold. Okay, so this is the the minimum action level at which you see the fundamental class of the manifold, the the surface in, in floor homology of the Hamiltonian. Okay, and so these, so that's C of H, that's the definition. And so as you could see, C is a function. You can think of it as a map from the space of time-dependent Hamiltonians to the real line. And it has a bunch of, what's made these useful is that they have a bunch of nice properties. I'll just state two of them for now. because These are really the only two, well, more. There's another one which I'll mention later. These are the, there are three properties I'll use today. Two of them are the following. So C of H is, C picks out a value from the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. And the second one is that it's continuous in this sense. So it's less than or equal to, say, the soup norm of H minus G. Yeah, what's the class of, uh, of the rest of the cycle? Is it a floor homology? Is it a class of sigma? Uh, so, so, I mean, this, you have a floor cycle, it represents a floor homology class. Right, and I look at the floor homology classes. So there is, there is an equivalence between floor homology of the Hamiltonian and the singular homology of the manifold. So I look at the floor homology classes, 
which represent the fundamental class. Okay, so, so there is, yeah, so there is some map that goes from floor homology to, I don't know, say more homology, and I. So there, there is, there is data hidden in here. Okay. Okay, so these guys, these spectral invariants, have had many interesting applications in symplectic geometry. Uh, two of, so one is, for example, I could name the proof of the Conley conjecture by. So I think it was used in Victor Ginsburg's work in the proof of the Conley conjecture. Um, it was also used by Entov and Poltrovich in the theory of quasi-morphisms and quasi-states. And there is a third, less prominent application which kind of motivated us. So I'll, I'll state that application. So this is the application that got us started on this project. So here's a question. By, it was posed by uh, so François Béguin, Sylvain Crovissier, and Frédéric Leroux. And what they asked was the following. Um, so, take, so take theta to be a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of and let C of theta be its conjugacy class. And their question was, so this C is different than the other C. Uh, curly C of theta is its conjugacy class. And the question was, could the conjugacy class of a given some Hamiltonian diffeomorphism be C0 dense in, in all of Ham. Okay, so can you have a conjugacy class whose closure in uniform topology gives you all of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms? And so I'll give you a very quick outline of the solution to this problem. So the answer is, so answer is no, and here's why. Uh, so you could define so define gamma of a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism to be C of H plus C of H inverse. So this is the Hamiltonian. So the flow of H bar is the flow of H inverse. Okay. Now. The spectral invariant depends on the Hamiltonian. But you could show that this sum does not depend on the Hamiltonian. It's an invariant of the Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. So, and gamma is, so gamma was defined first by, so gamma was defined by these three guys, Viterbo, Schwarz, and O. So they showed that gamma is a norm. It's a non-degenerate norm, so you know, it's non-trivial. Uh, it's gamma is constant on conjugacy classes. Okay, so this was the three of those guys, and I showed, I think it was a talk here where I first presented it a few years ago, that gamma is. C0 continuous. Okay, so gamma being a norm and constant conjugacy classes is true on basically on any symplectic manifold where you could define Hamiltonian floor theory. The C0 continuity, well, I was only able to show it in dimension two. I suppose it's true in higher dimensions, but I couldn't show it. Uh, okay, so this, this gives you the solution to this question. This tells you the answer is no, because, I mean, it's obvious, but let me just spell it out. So if theta is anything other than the identity, then gamma of, so gamma of theta is non-zero. Uh, 
is constant on conjugacy classes, so it's gamma of the conjugacy class of theta. It's, it's the same non-zero non number. And then by C0 continuity, it's, it's also non-zero on its C0 closure. OK? So in particular, the identity is not in the C0 closure of the conjugacy class of a, any Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. So Be approximated by. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how to separate those. Good question. Yeah, we need a new one. Yeah, so I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I should also say, the, so, so these guys, the case that was really most interesting to them was when sigma is S2. Uh, this solution works on S2 too. So really the motivation, uh, they were, there are other methods to solve, get the an that prove that the answer is no on the other surfaces. Uh, there are quasimorphisms of Gambato and Gis, and, uh, which are C0 continuous or Entoff-Poltrovich methods. So they methods took care of everything except for S2. And so the, the, the only thing that I managed to solve was the case of S2. Uh, but so the motivation really comes from S2, but we can't take care of S2 anyway, not yet. And so the three of these guys, uh, they're so they are they work in uh, dynamics, and uh, they're I mean they're nearby, but they're not symplectic geometers. So they somehow are not fully satisfied, maybe by by this solution that uses floor theory, and they felt like there should be a more direct dynamical way of uh, uh, solving this problem. So I, I presented this the solution of this problem where I, at UCO a few years ago. Uh, where I defined what spectral invariants were and so on. And Patrice Lecalvez was there, and he has uh, this beautiful theory of transverse foliations on surfaces. And he suggested to us a, a way of recovering, and, uh, recovering the spectral invariant through his theory. And so, so I should say that the inspiration for our work really comes from uh, some things that he said to us. So he, he kind of guided us on how to, what end should be, this invariant end should be. Okay, so that's the motivation for the talk, and now I'll tell you what n is. So definition of n. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll start here. So definition of n. It, it will take me a bit of time to define it. So I have to introduce a couple of concepts here. So the first one is really the, really the, the key concept, and that's the notion of a unlinked collection of fixed points. Um, so suppose x is a collection of contractible fixed points of some Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. We say this collection of fixed points is unlinked if the following holds. If uh, there exists an isotopy Ft, Ft is between 0 and 1, such that So, so first of all, this isotopy has got to get you from the identity to our Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. So that's the first condition. And the second condition is that it fixes every point in this, in this collection of fixed points. So I say a collection of uh, fixed points is unlinked. If you could find a, another is an isotopy that gets you from identity to your Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, which fixes these fixed points for all time. OK? 
Okay. Uh, so maybe uh, I'll see a few facts about these, the notion of unlinkedness. Uh, first thing I want to say is, so I'm not requiring x to be, for example, finite. It could be an infinite family of fixed points. Um, so the first fact is that x is unlinked if and only if every finite subset is. How you get how you check if a finite collection of fixed points is unlinked, and this one is easy. So if X is finite, so is that also fact one is what the convention could say? No, no, no. It's I mean you could. So, so, so you say if you have an infinite. I mean one direction could be trivial, but so if, if every finite thing is has this property, then I pick for each every finite set I find the FT. Yes. Then you claim that yeah, there's another FT that which, yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah. If it's discrete, I mean, it's finite. Uh, okay, except the case of R2, but I suppose compact support, so. No, no, but, but, so, but you don't assume they're non degenerate. No. Okay, so. I'm sorry? It cannot be entirely trivial. This fact? Yeah. No, it's not. Uh, oh, did I make it sound it's, cr it's I think it's a non trivial fact. Oh, okay, good. So I'm happy. Yeah, yes. Okay. I mean, uh, I would be more happy even if I don't understand it. <laughs> I can't tell you. It's in the appendix in the paper. Okay. Uh, but you have to work a little. Yeah, you have to do some work to show it. Um, I'm sure. So, so uh, there was a reason we had to write it in the appendix because Lacalvez proved it, but somehow. So I'm sure Lacalvez proved some version of this. I mean, this is really due to Lacalvez. So no, I don't. It didn't. The it proof did not use. Yeah. There has to be some work. Yeah, there, I agree. There is some work, and I, I cannot remember how I cannot remember how to uh, to prove this. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is non-trivial, and I definitely will not be able to tell you how to do it. Uh, at least not now. Uh, okay, but I could tell you a criterion that's. Uh, the isotopy, no, let's say smooth isotopy. I'm pretty sure continuous is enough. Okay, let's. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't make any difference if it's smooth or not. And it, actually, I don't even require it to be, by the way, Hamiltonian. So any isotopy is okay. Um, I really cannot remember how we did this. This because this is the part of the paper I did not do. I just read the proof once the other two guys had written it. Uh, yeah. Okay. But for finite sets, I could give you uh, a nice and easy criterion. Uh, so if x is finite, then x is unlinked. If and only if uh, the associated braid is unlinked. So, you know, you get a braid. So if if the braid is trivial, or if if the braid is trivial. Then it's unlinked. If it's non-trivial like this, then you just cannot unlink it. And this one was 
easier to prove, but I also cannot remember how to prove this one, not on the spot. Both of them used fiber bundle arguments, that's all I remember. And then here there was like a, a very technical and kind of technical lemma due to handle that, that somehow allowed us, uh, to, allowed us to prove this, uh, this criteria. Okay, so now, so these two tell you how to find unlinked sets, how to check if a set is unlinked. Uh, a third important thing is, so fact three is, and this is an immediate consequence of one, is that there exist maximal unlinked sets. Because you could now, since you could check it on finite subsets, you could just apply Zorn's law. Uh, maybe I should say another obvious corollary is a uh, corollary of two is a singleton is always unlinked, which I'm sure everybody believes. Okay, so that's, I think that's all I have to say for now about unlinkedness. So finding unlinked sets is, is really a, is kind of non-trivial. And checking, uh, and perhaps that's a part of, that's maybe the main reason why we can only get this for uh, autonomous Hamiltonians. It's because for autonomous Hamiltonians, if you have a collection of fixed points, it's, it's rather easy to see if they're, there's a nice and easy, way of seeing if things are unlinked or not. Maybe uh, I'll have time to show you when we get to the proof of the, the result. Uh, so there is a second part of the definition of N. Uh, and so here's the second ingredient. And then I'll be able to tell you what N is. So take uh, a contractible fixed point of a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. Uh, now you could pick an isotopy FT, so smooth isotopy, such that I, I need this to be smooth, such that FT of X is, so FT fixes X for all time. Uh, and of course, I want F0 is identity, and F1 is my Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. Then uh, I say, we say X has. non-positive rotation number if the following holds. If there exists, so this is just a criterion checking that the rotation number of the fixed point is, is non-positive. Uh, and I'm stating it this way because I don't want to define the rotation number of a fixed point. So if there exists a tangent vector at the point at x such that so, so such that the following path so here's a path given a non-zero tangent vector I could produce out of it a, a path in the circle so here's the path in the circle I look at the differential of ft at at, at the point x, I apply it to the vector v, and then I divide it by its norm. So this is a path in the circle, and I say the fixed point has non-positive rotation number if this path has non-positive total angular variation. So this, this, all this means is that the fixed point has rotation, non-positive rotation. And if, so the reason I don't want to define the rotation number is every time I define it, I get a whole lot of questions. Uh, so to say something that's maybe more friendly to a symplectic audience, I'll say what this means in terms of the colony zender index.
So equivalently, here are equivalent ways of saying something, a fixed point has non-positive rotation number. Uh, the mean index of x is equivalent to saying the mean index of x is Uh, I want to say positive. So somehow there's a sign, there's a change of sign. So that's, I have negative there, and here it's positive. If x is non degenerate, it's equivalent to saying the Conley Zender index of x is uh, greater than or equal to 1. And I have to tell you what my convention for the Conley Zender index is. So I'm assuming for a C2 small Morse function, it's the same as the Morse index. So, so fixed points with with a non negative with a non positive rotation number, they there are things with the uh, Conley Zender index two and above, which is what you need uh, for the fundamental class. It's what you'd get for the fundamental class. As I said, I will only prove something for autonomous Hamiltonians. So, so let me give you a picture of. Uh, what it means to have a non-positive rotation number for critical points of an autonomous Morse function. So if x is a saddle, then you know, it looks like nearby things look like that. I draw it, okay. And so, so you could see, for example, this, this, this tangent vector is fixed by the isotopy by, uh, generated by the Morse Hamiltonian. So this one has rotation number zero. So this is something with a saddle point has non-positive rotation number. And so does the local maximum. So if you have a local max, then nearby, Things are flowing in the clockwise direction. That's the negative direction. So, so for saddle, so this this condition picks out saddle points and local maxima of a Morse function. Okay, now I could tell you what n is. in the other direction. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus one. So I. See, yeah, so there's so many conventions. Right? Yeah, there. My convention is if I flow backwards, it's, it's a negative. No, not for me. There's there's a shift. I I don't know why. I I'm stuck with so the condition that. Uh, uh, so, but so this has Conley's so index so two. Yes. So that's. Okay. And the others are always certain dimensions. Yeah. There's a shift in the other okay. convention. So I can't remember why I, I'm used to this uh, convention, but so that's what I grew up with. Yeah. Um, OK, so I told you what unlinked sets were. I told you what non positive unlinked sets are. Now I'm going to tell you what a maximal non-positive on linked set is. And then definition of n. OK, so one more definition if I tell you what n is. So suppose you have a collection of fixed points. It, it's called, I'll call it the maximal uh, non-positive or negative. Maximal non positive unlinked set. So for short, I'll write noose, lack of an imagination. Uh, if, if the following conditions hold. So if first x must be unlinked, 
Secondly, every point in x must have non-positive rotation number. All x in all fixed points in this collection have non-positive rotation number. And lastly, it must be maximal among sets with these two properties. So maximal, uh, here I mean with respect to inclusion, of course, among sets with this property. OK, so I need to look at the collections of all maximal non-positive unlinked sets. So here is n. n of h is defined as follows. They just, OK, you could see kind of the parallel to this definition. Uh, so you take infimum over max, all maximal negative unlinked sets uh, of the time one map diffeomorphism of actions of these. So I'll take maximum of actions of the fixed points that are in the collection. So you look at maximal non-positive unlinked set. For each one, you look at the, you know, extract the value, the maximum action value, and then take infimum over all such maximal negative unlinked sets. It's as if, I mean, the definition is made these sorts of things are supposed to represent the fundamental class in, in floor homology. Somehow, I don't think that's true because the, well, that's definitely not true because the maximal negative unlinked set could have uh, fixed points in it with Conley's n or x different than two. But, but nevertheless, we can, prove, we can prove that n of h is equal to c of h for autonomous Hamiltonians. So here is, so here's the final part of the talk, and there are the results. So theorem is that n of h equals c of h for all autonomous h. Where c is the, the spectral invariant defined here. Okay, so you have no questions and I'll. So uh, dynamic description still assumes that definition is yeah, it is. Is it not? I mean, I mean, you don't need this to the whole market. Yeah, yeah, you don't need to know first theory, but let's assume you want to work with Yeah, OK. Uh, actually, this one is easier to work with than C. This is far more computable, as you'll see. It's much easier to compute this thing. In the case of autonomous. Yes. No, no, OK. But the other, otherwise, it's one that's difficult. Yeah. Actually, uh, uh, one motivation for us was that we wanted to com uh, computing action spectral invariance. And as far as I know, so now we can actually tell what the spectral invariant is. Like can, I can, uh, you'll see the proof gives an algorithm of what the spectral invariant should be. I, I'll give a recursive formula for C and N, and they both satisfy the same recursive formula. Do you have an inequality at this point, or could be any, in any direction? It could be in, general, in the I, We have nothing in the general case at this point. Maybe this is just a fluke that it works for autonomous things. How about if you take uh, and you start with some uh, autonomous and then you start considering the thing in small time dependent perturbations? And if you, in, in, in any type of idea you might like, is it still possible to define n in that case? Uh, or oh, no, the, uh, the, the equality, equality. yeah. The equality or an estimate? No, I suppose, I mean, if you, if you tinker a little bit, then the problem the problems appear when you start changing the set of when you start uh, when this set changes. 
So uh, if you tinker a little bit, this won't change if in the C-infinity topology. But as soon as the set of uh, the, this, the unlinked fixed points change, uh, and you'll see as a part of the proof, the unlinked fixed points for autonomous Hamiltonians have really simple forms. You can really write them down. As soon as that changes, we can't say anything. Uh, yes, from, no, did you, sorry, did you say from the definition? From the theorem it follows, <laughs> not from the definition. So you make a new definition, and you want to show it something else. Now, the other something else has a continuity property. Yes. Continuity of a zero, yeah? Yeah. Right. So now you have an easier definition here, yes. according to the limit principle. Yes. And then I ask the question, can they show with that easier definition no. that that thing is a zero complete? No. No, uh, okay. that's the hardest part, actually. Uh, okay. Yeah. So. so the, <laughs> yes. You. Yeah. You got. I mean, you got to the hardest part of the problem. We really cannot tell. We cannot prove n is C zero continuous. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you pr you move the Hamiltonian. This as soon as there is a bifurcation, this everything just falls apart. It's for. Thing, let's say. I mean, we know only f what we can get from this theorem. At some point, we have to prove like some sort of a continuity result. And they're like, and I can't remember it. Uh, so this is for all autonomous Hamiltonians. So first, we prove it for Morse Hamiltonians. And then you have to go from Morse to, uh, uh, from Morse to general autonomous Hamiltonians. So then we make some sort of a perturbation, a very small perturbation. As soon as, as long as you make a perturbation where you could keep track of the maximal negative unlinked sets, then you have continuity. If they change, then there is nothing. We have nothing after that. So, so we do prove some continuity result, but by, by making like really careful perturbations so that this, so that we could keep track of what happens here. I think also when you look at whenever you can have an e easy definition, you can't say too much about it. Is it the and, and if you work very hard to even put this to define this, then they actually have some nice properties. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so it's like homotopy theory or homology theory. I mean, the one is easy to define, but people are confused and so on. So it's the same story here. But uh, one thing, one nice thing you could prove with this and, uh, is that I think Lecalvis can prove that N is, uh, has the energy capacity inequality using his foliation. So it's got some nice properties. That's, that's already something. Yeah. OK, so here is the outline of the proof. I'm sorry? I think you mean soup. I mean soup, if it's. Or maybe it's because of compactness, maybe. Uh, yeah, but compactness, there, there's a max. I mean, it's attained by. So if it's finite, it's obviously it's a max. And if it's not finite, then the maximum is attained. Yeah. Uh, the maximum action is attained. Oh, Sorry? Maybe it's not the max in general. Maybe it's the soup? Yeah, I'll say it's soup. Okay, I'll, I'll write down the soup, but I'm pretty sure it's a max. I mean, no, no, no. If, if you have a collection of fixed points whose actions converge, they. Uh, the action is, so it's I mean, if you take the soup, this, the supremum action is going to be attained by, by some but fixed point. The, the max could be infinity. Because it's not finite. So they're not the Certain candidates which maybe ultimately are irrelevant. No, I mean the, no, the action, the action spectrum is bound, yeah. the action spectrum is bounded. Bound They're on this. Okay, sorry, the action spectrum is bounded. So, so it might not. But you have a sequence of points, and the limit yeah. point is in the soup. And then you still have uh, some kind of decision. Okay, so maybe it's a soup. It doesn't. Yeah. Good okay, if it makes you happy, I'll, I'll leave it as a soup. Okay. <laughs> okay, um, so now I want to say how we prove this. So how do we prove it? Uh, oh yeah, okay. And it's just an, uh, I mean, it's going to be an outline of the proof. So proof and the proof has two main steps. The first step is a definition. Again, sorry. So I'll define uh, a formal spectral invariant 
So we use just axiomatic properties of spectral invariance. But one of them is, is a new property. A formal spectral invariant. Sorry, before you go into proof, you said resolve is more than the theorem? Yes, there okay. is two more. Okay. Uh, there's two more that I think I'll get the chance to state. Okay. I wanted to make sure you were going to try this and is, state them. Yeah, yeah. No, this is the main result. And I'll, I'll have the time to state them. Yeah. <laughs> A formal spectral invariant is what? So the key point is formal a formal spectral invariant uh -huh, is a map C. So from the space of time-dependent Hamiltonians on your surface to the real line with the following properties. So you, you will not need to know this definition anymore. Uh, so first of all, I require that C of H is in the spectrum of H, so hence the name spectral invariant. Secondly, C is continuous with respect to, I mean, any reasonable topology on the space of Hamiltonian. So for example, C infinity. It, they're all kind of equivalent. If you have C infinity continuity, then you automatically get this continuity with respect, this Lipschitz inequality that I just erased. And the third one, so, th so it's, it's really well known that the spectral invariance of Viterbo and Schwartz satisfy these two properties, or all of them. And, but here's the third one which is a new property, and that's the max formula. Uh, so we have some general max formula, but I'll write down the version that we just need to prove this theorem. So suppose you have h1 to hn, a bunch of Hamiltonians supported in disjoint disks. Uh, then s the spectral, the formal spectral invariant of the sum should be the maximum of the formal spectral invariant. Uh, yeah, the formal spectral invariance. So this is kind of like a property that's analogous to, you know, if, if you have a Morse function with a bunch of local maxima, then the fundamental class is represented by the sum of those. So you could see in a more homology, this is trivial. Uh, so in floor theory, it's not clear that this, uh, at least we had to prove that this max formula holds for, for Hamiltonians, uh, for Hamiltonians. So this is, I'll, I'll write this down in a second. So I'll write down a theorem saying this is true for Claude's, uh, for Viterbo and Schwartz spectral invariance. And the fourth property is Okay, so these three properties don't nail down anything because if you're an R2 and look at uh, compactly supported Hamiltonians, zero satisfies all three. It's, you know, the map that associates zero to every function. So uh, let's say C of H is non-zero for H supported in some disk. H, there exists H, sorry, there exists H such that C of H is non-zero. So this, just to rule out the obvious thing. And so the question is, so there are two questions you might ask now. One is, so one is the question I asked a few minutes ago is, is uh, N a formal spectral invariant in this sense? And the answer is no. It's clear that N is spectral. It's clear that it ma satisfies the max formula. Let's take two Hamiltonians supporting two disjoint disks. The, the braids generated by these, the fixed points are, are separate. So if one is unlinked, the other one is unlinked. So it, from that, it, the max formula follows immediately. But continuity is what we can't prove. That's the hard one. 
And then the, the other question is, is the spectral invariant of Viterbo and Schwartz, is, it, is that a formal spectral invariant? So that's theorem two. Except for two, yeah. Okay. It's more or less, it's very easy to show n satisfies everything except for two. So, so theorem, let's say this is theorem two, is that uh, the spectral invariant of Viterbo plus Schwartz is formal. Meaning, the key, the key point here is that it satisfies this max formula. Uh, Strong can prove the same thing using different methods. Uh, and uh, there is something else I want to say here. And the spectral invariant of O doesn't satisfy this max formula. So on the two sphere, the spectral invariant doesn't sa satisfy max formula, hence a part of our problems. We don't really know why. OK. So I've sh so here's theorem 2. And I won't say anything about the proof of theorem 2 unless somebody really wants to know about it. Um, so theorem 3 is, OK, so I've shown, oh yeah, so theorem 3 is that C of H Let's write it this way. N of H equals C of H for, oh, what do I want to say? C, a formal spectral invariant so something that just satisfies these properties, then, then we can show C of H equals n of h for autonomous h. Okay, so that kind of gives you the outline of the proof of how, how you get theorem one. So th first you prove theorem two. This is where, so all the floor theory is here in theorem two. And then the rest is just, you know, proving, you know, it's an abstract proof. Just I should say uh, there's a theorem two. We can prove it in not just in dimension two, but in all dimensions for aspherical uh, manifolds. And we don't need you know disks or balls, but for any collection of Louisville domains. Uh, so we push the floor theory and the generating function theory here, and then that's out of the picture. So then you move on to this part. And I want to just give you an outline of how you prove this theorem three. This is where you see a little bit about unlinked sets. Uh, so not for any sequence, but so a part of the proof is, so as I'll explain, first we prove it for autonomous Morse functions. Then we need an approximation argument to go to non-Morse uh, non functions. And what we do is given a, 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 non, a degenerate more, uh, Hamiltonian, a degenerate autonomous function, we approximate it by uh, an appropriate sequence of Hamiltonian. So not just any arbitrary. But, and then the approximation is such a way that you could, as I said before, you could keep track of the, somehow you could put the unlinked sets for the approximating Hamiltonian in bijection with the unlinked sets for your, uh, the, the original Hamiltonian, the, not, the degenerate Hamiltonian. No, so and the reason is, uh, so there is a fundamental reason, and that's because I unlink everything is kind of unlinked in higher dimensions, oh, right? right? Uh, and Lacalus's theory is just not there oh, okay. either. 
Is, is, this is only something that will only surface thing. Yeah, this is a surface. This is two-dimensional well, dynamics. Just, uh, maybe, uh, I mean, so uh, there should be invariant targets for energy storage. There should be, you know, if you, if you study such a thing there and you look at the mapping cylinder, you know? Yeah. Yeah. for the mapping cylinder of the oh. system. Just, yeah. So I don't know anything fancy. I just write down uh, the Hamiltonian, so I take interval across the surface, identify it. Yeah. I, I get the energy surface. Yeah? Yes. And I can say something about it because of the surface abstraction. And, uh, ah, yeah, OK. Yeah. But now if things are getting mixed up, nevertheless, you could talk on an energy surface about linking the string. That's right. There should be something. Yeah. You haven't thought about it, but that's that so sounds that's right. Something like capacity, so capacity type stuff for four dimensional domains is usually are being captured in the boundary of them. Yes. There should still be something about it. I, I, okay, I, we haven't thought about it, but yeah. Okay. In case we don't have anything to do. Oh yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I'm always looking for something to do. That's it's a good that's a good suggestion. Uh I started a little late. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, so here's the proof. Step A. Uh, I'll take sigma to be R two. This is this is really the hardest part. And H Morse. H Morse. So autonomous. Oh yeah. Before I forget. So. No. I'll say this after I, I say this part. Uh, so what do I want to say about this? Where are my notes? Oh yeah, and I well H is Morse, but uh, so H supported in a disk, and then Morse in the sense that every critical point in the disk uh, is non-degenerate. And now, great, there's color chalk. So there are two cases. The, I'll explain the harder case first. So suppose H has a saddle point. If it, has, if it doesn't have a saddle point, it, the dynamics is super easy. So if H has a saddle point, then I'll draw a picture in a second to, so here's the lemma, but which I won't really write down, but kind of write down. So there exists what I'll call an outermost saddle point. Now, I'll, I'll say in a picture what I mean. Outermost saddle, uh, say, uh, I'll call it S sub zero. So here's what I mean by outermost saddle. Uh, here's a disk where the support of H is. Uh, so given a saddle point, its, it's level set is kind of like a, is two circles pinched at the saddle point. One might be inside the other, but I'll draw it this way. Maybe I should draw it a little bigger. And I'll call the, so here's S0. I'll say it's an outermost saddle if there exists no critical points of H outside these two pinched disks. And such saddle point always exists. So, so there exist, there exists no critical point of H uh, here, outside, outside these two things. So I'll call this part B. And so what this means is that since you have no critical points here, this pinched annulus is foliated by level sets of the Hamiltonian. And you get a bunch of fixed points here, but no, they're all non-trivial fixed points. So you'll have some fixed points here. So let's call it x0 and x1. Okay. And then you'll have other fixed points inside here, uh, which I'll deal with later. Uh, I'll call the restriction of the Hamiltonian to this. So let's call this part this disk t0 and this disk t1. And I'll call the restriction of the Hamiltonian here h sub t0 and h sub t1. Uh, th they are fixed points. So, oh, okay. yeah. So outside this, there are no critical points outside this level, uh, uh, outside of these two disks. So which means out here, since there are no critical points, you just get 
I mean, it's, level, it's foliated by level sets of the Hamiltonian. So you get non-trivial fixed points. Okay. Yeah, some non-trivial fixed points. There, there, may, be, there may be some non-trivial fixed points there. Uh, the reason for this terminology is that if you know, if you know, if you know what the rape tree, associated rape tree is, this, this part is the base of the rape tree. And then you get, here's a T1, one branch of the tree, and T0. I mean, it might be complicated here. Here's the base. So you get this picture. And now it's, it's really easy to see what the uh, unlinked fixed points are. If you have two periodic points, so if you've got x0 and x1, and they're both fixed points, x0 always links with x1. Uh, because you know, if you fix x1, for example, x0 goes around it. It goes around it once or I don't know how many ever times. So there is a linking between these two fixed points. So if you, if you pick. A uh, fixed point outside in B, it's a maximal unlinked set on its own. And it's got to go in the right. Oh, I want it to go in this direction. That would mean I'd, I'd need the Hamiltonian to be positive. So there's a case one where the Hamiltonian is positive on, on the base of the tree. And then there is a different case where it's negative. So if it's positive, you could get a fixed maximal unlinked set by picking just a single fixed point out here. And then everything that's inside it links with it. And you know, I mean, you could pick all the trivial fixed points at infinity. Or you could pick a bunch of, another way to get unlinked sets is pick a bunch of fixed points, on an unlinked set here and an unlinked set here in the union. And so you see, it's, it's super easy to s spot the unlinked sets for an autonomous system. And here is. boundary here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, maybe that's a part of the Morse assumption? So uh, when you talk about the R2 case, you mean it's compactly supported? Yes. Yeah, so it's compactly supported. And I'll perturb it so that the fixed points are non-degenerate. So you, you're worried that there might be a bunch of subtle so points. that morphs outside. So it's yeah, morphs in the interior of the support. Yeah, you could have stuff. So I want to say you could perturb and make that, sis I mean, that's a that's not generic. But then I don't know what it means to say there's morphs on the interior. Is it that you suggest that? So I means all the fixed points in the interior are non-degenerate, and you have no this what the situation described where critical points converge to boundary just doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is that good? <laughs> OK. Uh, so that means either on the boundary you have to go up or down. But you yes. Go up and down. Yes. Yes. Uh, that's why, I mean, I said H, right. So uh, you start from the boundary and go up. Or you start from the boundary and go down. So I mean, the case where you start from the boundary and just go up. Otherwise, the rape tree, yeah. So that's the case where the rape tree is well defined. Or, I mean, I guess you could make. The rape tree would look funny otherwise. Uh, OK, so what we do here, OK, I want to finish fast. So in this case, you could give a recursive formula for what the invariant n is, because I, I kind of described to you what the unlinked sets were. So here is the definition. Uh, here is a recursive formula where you could show, you could show n satisfies this recursive formula. And here's what it is. Uh, so first, you have to take care of the unlinked sets, which are just the single points outside here. So it's going to be the minimum of actions of fixed points in the base B. So I have a minimum of a minimum. There's, I could probably rewrite this in a better way. And then 
you have to worry about the unlinked sets that come from inside these two disks. So for that, you get maximum of n of restriction of h to the first tree or the first disk and, and then the restriction of h to the second disk. OK, so you could show n satisfies this, this recursive formula. And it's, it's, this is pretty easy. I basically kind of said how you prove this. Uh, so now you want to show c satisfies the same recursive formula. And that's, that's kind of where all the work is. So then we showed that. So the proof goes by, by computing what c is. So we showed that c of h satisfies the exact same recursive formula. Okay, so then this reduces the argument of proving c equals n to an induction on the number of saddle points. And the base case will be the case where you have no saddle. And that's, so that's case, case one, this was case one with a saddle point, and then, okay, so then I go to the case where no saddle, or case, I don't know, this is case 1.2 or something, case something, if there are no saddles, then, then the, the dynamics is super easy. So you have, I'm still assuming H restrict to do this. H starts near the boundary disk and goes up. So then what this means that not having a saddle is means that you have a local, a single maximum at somewhere inside the disk and dynamics like this. So then the only unlinked set you have is this singleton plus the trivial fixed points outside. Oh, sorry, you might have you might have fixed points here too. You might have some fixed points there. So then n of h will be the minimum of actions of this fixed points. Uh, uh, all minimum of the actions of the fixed points, the non-trivial fixed points. And you could prove c of h satisfies the same thing. And so that takes care of the induction step. OK, that's the case of the disk. And then for surfaces, uh, okay, I'll stop here because I've gone way over time. It's an exercise for the audience. Uh, exercise for the audience, yes. Thank you.